Hello and welcome to today's EcoCast, Discovering Storage, Hyperconvergence, and Composable Options. On today's event, you'll hear from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Datacore, Cohesity, and Nutanix. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. If you have not been on an EcoCast or MegaCast event before, you should know that we at Actual Tech Media created the EcoCast and MegaCast event series to help educate IT pros about the latest and greatest in enterprise technology, to help you do it quickly and efficiently from your home or office, to get all your questions answered, and to have a chance to win some very valuable prizes. Now, before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping we first need to cover. We've got some awesome prizes. I'll talk about those in just a moment, as well as the eligibility requirements. We'll have some poll questions for you and our audience. We appreciate your participation in those, and we want to help you get all your questions answered as well. Use the questions box in your console, and we'll do our best to answer all those questions, saving the best questions for our expert presenters on today's event. We also want this to be social. I'll talk about the hashtag for today's event over on Twitter in just a moment. And keep in mind, you can tweet directly from your console at the bottom of your screen using the Twitter icon. And finally, we have resources. We have handouts from each of today's presenters there in the handouts tab on your console. On today's event, you'll have a chance to win one of three Amazon $500 gift cards. To be eligible for the prize drawing, you must be present on the live event. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry the drawing has already occurred. All prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and you also must meet the requirements in the full prize terms and conditions, which can be found at our website, events.actualtechmedia.com. Through the Megacast and Ecocast event series, we have supported the charities you see on the screen. Thanks to generous attendees who have won prizes and chosen to donate their prize value to charity. If you'd like to do that, we would love to help you, and we appreciate that in advance. The hashtag for today's event is ATM EcoCast. I'll be monitoring the hashtag and following just about anyone who tweets using the hashtag. You can follow Actual Tech Media and me, David M. Davis, on Twitter as well. Now we're posting all of our latest and greatest content over on LinkedIn, so make sure that you follow Actual Tech Media on LinkedIn. You can use the icons on the top right-hand side of your screen to connect to our LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook website. You can also subscribe to our podcast in the iTunes podcast store. Just look for it, the 10 on Tech podcast. And now I'm excited to be joined by Mr. Scott D. Lowe, CEO of Actual Tech Media, also known as Mr. Hyperconvergence. Scott, thanks for being on the event today. Thanks for having me, David. So we want to chat for just a few minutes here about kind of the state of, of hyperconvergence and composable. And, you know, the first question I had for you is, what should IT pros look for when selecting new storage, HCI, and composable solutions? You know, I also do some IT consulting, so I'm going to give the standard consultant answer of it depends. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're looking for um, something where you want to replace everything in the data center, you've got to start to take a look at more of the full breadth feature and platform capabilities that each of the solutions that you're evaluating brings to bear. Um, you know, do they bring the complete management experience you're looking for? Do they bring the capability to do public cloud integration? Do they, and maybe do they bring data protection capabilities if you're looking to replace your current data protection solution? Do they partner with the right data protection networking vendors? Are they providing a, um, you know, other surround experiences that you're looking for if you're going to replace an entire stack somewhere in a data center or in other locations? Um, if you're looking for something uh, for like a robo or edge use case. Maybe you're looking for something that may not be quite as feature filled, but that has a very low cost of ownership because you're gonna basically be stamping these things out in dozens or hundreds or even thousands of sites. Um, you know, so it's gonna really come down to what the use case is. There's a lot of application centric silos. You may be buying something to support a specific application rather than all of your applications, in which case, you know, the flexibility may not be as, as critical and you can stay with something where it's a little bit more prescribed um, rather than providing a huge uh, amount of, uh, of customization. So I really think it comes down to what's your use case and then take a look at what the reality is behind that use case. If you're looking for, you know, and be realistic. So what I mean by that is if you're just looking for something to support a single application, you probably don't need 
um, all the bells and whistles. So if you're looking for something that is a, for a robo environment, you're gonna be looking for something very different than you would be if you're looking for something for a static data center environment. So I, would, I wouldn't say specific guidance for every use case because that'd be too general, um, but take a look at what your use case really is, what the reality is behind supporting that use case, and then narrow down the vendor selection based on what you're seeing available from each vendor in the market. Okay, okay, solid advice. So I know, I mean, one of the big use cases is consolidation. And one of the big benefits of hyperconvergence is, you know, greater density. I mean, so what's been happening around density and consolidation when it comes to CPUs and core count? So the, the big news that actually happened this week is that VMware announced a change. I believe it starts April 2nd to vSphere licensing. And this sort of harkens back to the battle days of 2011 or 12 or whatever, I think it was 11, when they released the, what effectively became known as VRAM tax at an attempt to change the licensing mechanism. And just around a year later, they rolled it back and said, our bad, and went back to the standard, you know, socket-based CPU licensing for vSphere. Well, the world of the data center and the world of the, the CPU has changed pretty dramatically in the last almost 10 years, um, which is no surprise uh, to anyone, I would imagine. And we're seeing now CPUs with core counts that are something that weren't even imaginable when you and I started in IT back in you know the 90s or whenever it was. And we see cores with so CPUs with 64 cores, and, and there's gonna be more coming every day. And there's a point at which VMware is looking at this going, huh, there's a lot more compute so that in these systems, which means there's fewer servers, which means we're selling fewer licenses. Now, you know, for those that are um, not always all that interested in the corporate bottom line, that may not be a big deal, but the VMware, it probably is something of a concern. And so this week, they basically put a cap on the number of cores that a single CPU license will support, and it's 32 cores. Now, there's been a lot of uh, pixels expended on Twitter and other places about about this and some supporting it and some saying this is terrible for the consumer. No one wants a price increase and frankly, this is a price increase. However, if you look at the data center, a lot of organizations don't have CPU cores in this kind of count range. And in fact, we're gonna ask a poll question on this event to that effect. And we're really interested in learning um, more from our audience about what they have in their data center um, to see just exactly what the impact here will be. But again, the impact I think is going to be relatively minimal for most organizations. Those that have highly dense environments where they've chosen to, um, where they've chosen to go very high with core count and, and RAM and, and all this other stuff so they have fewer boxes, it will impact them. And one of the things that VMware is doing with this program is for those that have already purchased vSphere licenses for a 64 core server or 64, uh, 64 core sockets, um, they're gonna provide you with free licenses as basically a, a true up sort of thing. So there, if you've got you know, two 64 core processors and a server, um, that's gonna soon require four licenses instead of two. They're gonna grant you those two additional licenses. However, they will charge you additional maintenance and support costs for those licenses. So that's something that people are gonna have to plan for and that starts April 2nd. Um, so there's not a lot of there's not a whole lot of time to plan on that, and it will probably create some potential budget challenges for some organizations. I see this potentially having the biggest impact again on those high core, high density environments, and possibly somewhat for edge applications where there is a desire, where there's a, a need for um, systems that are dense because of space constraints. So again, we're gonna see exactly how this falls out, um, but those are a couple of areas where I could see um, potential challenges emerging that we may not have uh, expected uh, to see because of the change in this licensing program. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's interesting to see what's changing you know, in the hyperconverged world. Thank you so much, Scott, for all your insight on what IT pros should look for when selecting new solutions and for you know, what's new with HCI. Thanks for being on. Thank you. All right, cool interview there with Mr. Scott D. Lowe. And as Scott mentioned, we've got some poll questions here. Uh, so the first one is on the screen, and that's do you have server CPUs in your on-premises environment with 33 or more cores per socket? And I'll share the results of this with you so you can see kind of how you stack up with your peers. I'm curious to find out 
you know, what's, what percentage of uh, companies out there have CPUs that are so dense, that have so many cores uh, in each socket? So I'll leave this for, up for just a minute here. And I'll actually be, uh, like I said, sharing the results, but I'm also going to send these back to Scott because, you know, I think he's going to do a follow-up to his blog post and be sharing some of these results either in a blog or on Twitter because he really wanted to find out the results uh, of this question, and then I've got a follow-up question. All right, and I just saw a note here. Uh, Ed is saying uh, we got lucky. We got 28 cores per host of Perfect, so that's under 32 or 32 or less. And uh, Matthew said, we just deployed a 12-node VxRail cluster with two 20-core CPUs per host. Uh, this is affecting us, but should be covered for now as we bought our licensing prior to April 1st. So, uh, I mean, you only have 20 cores per CPU, so this is, this is uh, 33 or more. So I wouldn't think it would affect you uh, either, Matthew, unless I'm misunderstanding it. But um, good to know, good to know. I I'm not hearing actually from anyone uh, in the chat, at least, who has more than 33, uh, 33 or more cores per socket, uh, although 22 respondents, 18%, have said that, yes, they do have 33 or more cores. So let me share the results of this one with you and take a look at, at that. 17%, 21 respondents said they had 33 or more cores per socket, so some very dense uh, CPUs in those environments out there, but 66% said no, they do not have CPUs that are so dense. And 16% said they're not sure. Uh, and then now here's another poll, and this is what's your organization's current standard core count per socket when you buy servers? And if you don't know the, sta the standard for new purchases, just indicate the average core count that you, know, you have in place today. Uh, David uh, responded and said, isn't AMD the only one that has 32 cores per CPU? Uh, you may be right, David, actually. I'm not sure about that. Good question. I know that these core counts, you know, just keep going up and up. So, I mean, if Intel doesn't have it today, I'm sure they'll have it soon. Uh, and then soon after that, they'll have, you know, 48 and then 64. Okay, David said uh, AMD has a 64 core. Very Good feedback. Thank you, David. Uh, Lawrence said enterprises can certainly look at AMD C CPUs, but it will take more time to add to the environment. Uh, Matthew said Intel uh, Gold offers up to 22 cores per CPU. And I'll share that link, Matthew. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone who responded to this poll. So let me share the results. And you can see here 20% said eight cores are their standard, 16 or another 20% said 16 cores are their standard, 10% uh, said 24 cores are their standard, 9% said 25 to 32%, and actually only one person said their standard is 32 or, or more, uh, or over 32 at this point. So uh, very cool. Thank you for those responses. I'll be sharing those with Scott. He's going to be using that on some social media and in an upcoming blog post as well. All right, now final poll question before I introduce our first presenter on the event today. And that is, what's your time frame for adding new or refreshing existing infrastructure in your environment? All right, thank you everyone for responding to that poll question. We do appreciate it. All right, thank you for those responses. Now it is time to kick off today's EcoCast. And now we're going to bring in our first presenter. Here we go. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter on today's event. That is Mr. Chuck Wood, Senior Product Marketing Manager at HPE. Take it away, Chuck. All right. Thank you, David. So I'm here today to give you an HPE's perspective on how customers are shifting from software-defined to AI-driven. And this is really a new perspective on how they're reimagining hyperconverged with HP SimpliVity. So excited to share this news with you today. So when I talk to customers routinely, every day I speak with new customers, and these are the realities we're seeing with virtual machine VM admins. They're, they're constantly dealing with 
complexity. The infrastructure and environments are still too complex. They're constantly firefighting. They come in in the morning and many times they spend a good portion of the day just reviewing logs, finding out what, what infrastructure or VM failed or dealing with uh, the uncontrolled VM sprawl they're faced with. They're under pressure to lower costs continually and to do more with less. Many of them have uh, a, a fixed number of resources and they need to also deliver more for the business in terms of innovation. So in face of this, you know, before we get into the tech you know, we, we pause it with customers and prospects. What if we could talk about a solution or technology that literally gave 91% more time to innovate, to think about cloud initiatives, or to provide economic impact in the form of 192% return on investment, literally pay back within, a, within one year. And these may seem bold, but HPE actually commissioned Forrester Research to perform a total economic impact of customers who have deployed HP SimpliVity, and these are some of their remarkable outcomes. What if we could talk about 69% cost savings from moving from your legacy architectures to hyperconverged? And what about getting gaining agility in the form of terabyte size VM recovery in three in 60 seconds with three clicks uh, to mitigate attacks including for malware or just day-to-day -day operations where you need to recover VMs and get back to data fast. And finally, what if it was delivered by one simple familiar interface that gives you a simple experience and includes intelligence? These are the types of outcomes we're talking about. So from the HPE perspective, Software Defined has really transformed the industry, moving beyond traditional uh, fixed siloed or, or hardware confined environments. Software Defined has also provided innovations in terms of automation, allowing for on-demand ability to provision resources and do this uh, fairly flexibly. But the future now is past Software Defined. We're talking about AI driven that allows you to run in an autonomous way, li literally provides infrastructure that is intelligence, it's self-healing, it's self-optimizing, and allows you to uh, provision and run your clusters, your virtual machines across sites and, and across infrastructure resources and do this in a more uh, efficient manner. So the, the future as we see it, it's about artificial intelligence and global intelligence. Through application and cloud-based machine learning and deep telemetry from every connected system over the HP SimpliVity install base and HPE install base, we have the ability to deliver a completely new HCI experience. This is what enterprises and businesses are looking for. This helps solve the day two and beyond challenges where infrastructure becomes self-managing, self-healing, self-optimizing, and it's a completely new HCI experience that's even simpler. So we're excited to introduce and speak about the HPE SimpliVity Intelligent HCI product line. It's, it delivers on an intelligently simple platform that's hyper efficient and edge optimized and provides cloud connected outcomes. And we'll, we'll drill into each one of these capabilities as we take you through with a, with a distinct focus on InfoSight. So this is an illustration of how we simplify the environment What's to simplify? The stack of infrastructure on the left is is in many today is available today in many infrastructure data centers and, and, and sites where you have switches and servers and hypervisors, storage layers, as well as high available storage and backup appliances. All of this, imagine, is collapsed into an all-in-one stack from HPE, provisioned on pro powerful ProLiant servers that are secure. It includes the hypervisor as well as advanced data services. And this is all packaged and managed, delivered simply to customers. So it's simple to manage, simple to own, simple to grow, simple to transform and run their virtualized workloads. The net result is to collapse the silos, eliminate the need for VM specialists and allow VM generalists to manage the infrastructure and reduce overall costs. So the a key capability that HPE introduced last year was in InfoSight for HPE SimpliVity. This is about delivering global intelligence 
shifting from simple HCI to intelligent HCI. HP SimpliVity provides customers with predictive resource planning, removing the guesswork out of managing their virtual machine environments. It provides global visibility and analytics, saving them time, which otherwise they would have to use other tools and methods and time to go in and get this type of VM data and visibility into backups and efficiencies across their estate. And finally, it provides support automation and wellness that really enables self-managing IT and, and simplifies full end-to-end -end lifecycle management. So we'll go into more details. Uh, this slide shows some of the dashboards uh, within InfoSight for HP SimpliVity. It's been an incredible adoption. Customers are really excited about this because it gives them this, this global federated view of their environments. They can then manage all of this through vCenter when they need to provision and maintain the VMs, ads, do ads, moves, and changes. But they get this global SaaS view dashboard through InfoSight without extra code. It's all, all they need is a, a browser and they can point to the InfoSight site and they'll see their entire estate, uh, including these rich views and, and data. A key, key one customers really like is the predictive analytics that shows them their growth within their clusters over time and will literally show them when they're expected to run out of space so they can do thoughtful planning to easily expand or grow or reprovision the workloads to adjust for that, uh, that future change. As well, it, it shows top visibility into, into the most uh, busy virtual machines, which ones are consuming the most space for not only capacity, but also associated backups, as well as which VMs are consuming the most resources from an IOPS and, uh, and delivering expected latencies. So all of this is provided uh, in a federated way across one site or multiple sites, and it's all included in the, in the HPE maintenance contract for SimpliVity. So uh, as well, it's very well known, HP provides industry leading efficiency with SimpliVity. And we do this through our, our architecture that has inline dedupe compression optimization. We actually eliminate IOs, which is one of the most expensive resources in the data center. And we do this in a way that doesn't impact performance. So our customers are gaining 90% capacity savings on, on backup and primary VMs. Many customers see more because they're taking more backups now because they can. And we do this in an all, all in a, an efficient capability within the system. As well, it's common knowledge, but worth repeating, HP SimpliVity includes a full built-in backup and disaster recovery capability included with the systems. This obviates the need for many third-party products such as replication products or WAN optimization or automation orchestration and many other tool sets, or many customers actually right size their use of these tools and use them in conjunction with HP SimpliVity. But a recent survey found that uh, over 90% of our customers find value in the built-in data protection and they're using it, not only for the VM backups, but more importantly for rapid recovery we become the recovery option of first choice for many, many uh, VM admins because it's so fast recovering terabyte sized VMs with three clicks in a few seconds. So uh, in terms of the optimization at the edge, we're, we're seeing more and more adoption uh, of multi-site deployments. Uh, imagine retailers or manufacturing sites where they have a core data center and, and then multiple remote sites where they may lack IT resources, we can now have a, a well-designed optimized solution for these types of edge, edge deployments where they can deploy two nodes for high availability to run their workloads at the edge, requiring zero admin at the edge because they can centrally manage this through a unified interface, yet they get ability to rapidly recover and move VM and VM data uh, across their sites, taking advantage of our data architecture. So in terms of customer examples, and including InfoSight support, these are some customers who are taking advantage. One is a North American retailer with 155 stores. They've deployed 
HP SimpliVity across these stores, which is two of our extra small nodes, and then at core data centers where they're housing their backups. And they, the quote there says it all from this engineer. If you're a retailer with, with many, many stores and you actually uh, want to deploy simplicity, ease of restore, and keep the environment running, SimpliVity is well suited. Another customer, Altera Mountain, that owns uh, several ski resorts across the country. If you've ever skied at Alta uh, or Snowbird or Big Bear in California or, uh, or Snowbird, uh, this is, uh, they house actually their architecture running on VM on HP SimpliVity. And they've been able to optimize 28 of their resort sites, in some cases collapsing the rack from seven to one, saving space, improving their resiliency, and they're getting tremendous uh, data efficiency gains across all their sites, leveraging our built-in backup and recovery. Finally, on the, on the uh, support and endorsement of HPE InfoSight for SimpliVity, this customer says it all. Uh, they're an insurance company uh, in Europe, and they, he basically says, I just love the tech. InfoSight is basically AI that is looking after my environment when I'm not looking. It gives them extra hands and automation and predictive support so he can focus on other parts of the business. Moving on, we also deliver a, a unique guarantee that's built into the system. In addition to InfoSight, we provide a hyper guarantee that allows you to uh, efficiently save 90% capacity across primary VMs and backups. Importantly, deliver one minute restore or backup times for terabyte size VMs. This is becoming more and more popular with customers on a day-to-day -day basis to take advantage of this rapid agility capability. Three clicks to backup, restore, move, clone, all from within vCenter, the very familiar interface and customers uh, really enjoy the simplicity. And then management and availability speak to allowing them to control policies across multiple, literally thousands of VMs easily and simply, and also deliver uptime guarantees as they grow their environments. Uh, finally, we, we talk about security built into the system. The HPE ProLiant line is the most secure platform for running virtualized workloads with capabilities like Silicon Root or Trust. And when you marry this, innate hardware security with the powerful security features built into SimpliVity, including restoral capabilities and data protection capabilities, along with our new role-based access control. It provides you with a very secure, uh, small profile system to manage your virtualized environments in a secure way. So the outcomes delivered are, are showcased here, intelligently simple, uh, accelerating apps and service delivery, as, as shown by our 60 second restore of through three clicks of terabyte size VM, hyper efficiency in an all-in-one system provided by HP that allows you to save upwards of 10X on the capacity savings through efficiency, now powered with AI-driven operations to make it even more efficient and simpler. And we deliver optimization across your sites, whether you have two sites, three sites, or hundreds of sites, we can provide you with an efficient way to manage and deploy your virtual machines in many cases where you lack IT resources out at the edge. So with that, let's like to thank you for the time and uh, here's some links for, for more information and I'll turn it back over to David for any other questions. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation, Chuck. Uh, we do have some questions here for you from the audience. First question, let's see, they're asking, uh, you said that HPE InfoSight was introduced on October 28th. Uh, how's the adoption been since then? Yeah, yeah good question. So uh, uh, absolutely, HPE, we released the software. It was version 3.7.10 for HP SimpliVity last October, October 28th. And adoption has been phenomenal. The key here is this is not new, uh, new code that has to be in deployed or new agents or new hardware that has to be shipped out. It's a SaaS application. InfoSight is a complete SaaS uh, play where we're, all they need is to, is to browser into infosight.simplivity.com and register their existing HP SimpliVity nodes that are running the 3.7.10 code or higher 
and they get access to this, these new capabilities and new views along with the predictive analytics. So there's no new code. And uh, we've had upwards of uh, 500 plus customers now already registered and take advantage of it. And we have thousands of customers deployed with SimpliVity. So the adoption has been very fast. They're raving about it. They really like, as they have when, they, when they've when used, many of them have used this before with, with Nimble and the other HP storage products and even our HP server line that has InfoSight now. So you're, we're now seeing the benefit across the HP SimpliVity install base and adoption has been fantastic. Wow, that's great to hear. Awesome. So uh, let's see, another question here they're asking, uh, is SimpliVity offered through HPE GreenLake? Yeah, good question. We offer, we offer, and our customers benefit from the flexibility and financing options that HPE provides. One of them is, is through the GreenLake offer where they can consume uh, as a service, many of our products, including HP SimpliVity. So customers buy HP SimpliVity in a CapEx model uh, on, a, on a three year term, et cetera. But now with GreenLake, we're seeing broader adopt, more broader adoption with uh, as a service where they purchase it on a pay-as-you-go basis through GreenLake. Uh, as well, we're seeing more adoption of our HP Point Next offerings for uh, installation services and, and other higher-level consulting services, uh, which which HP provides through uh, GreenLake and Point Next. Very nice. I like that flexibility there. Um, Another question, what are some of the most popular use cases for SimpliVity? So as with other ACI, the, the key is targeting, you know, simplifying IT. A key one is around just modernization of infrastructure, tech refreshes. As servers you know, that may be two, three, four years old are, are uh, potentially needing to be retired, literally to save rack space, uh, we will commonly go in with with uh, infrastructure tech refreshes. In many cases, there there are greenfield opportunities where they're deploying new workloads, and they they may be in space constrained environments, or they want to get the benefits of the smallest possible footprint. This is especially true for remote office or edge deployments. We're we're being deployed as you show as I showed you for that run retail store, but even more. Uh, remote edge deployments are occurring where they want co-provisioned. So this remote edge is is a hot new use case. But even data center uh, modernization from a backup perspective, where they want to improve their DR posture, we're many times going in and on the budget of a disaster recovery backup refresh, where they can get that capability plus the infrastructure to run VMs. So it's a, it's a data protection refresh that drives the initial acquisition of, of hyperconverged. And then uh, of course, VDI is another popular one, but those are the core key use cases, I, I'd say, where, that we're seeing the most of right now. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, a lot of variety there in the use cases. Um, there's obviously an existing SimpliVity customer here uh, asking, they say they have SimpliVity, uh, but they don't have InfoSight. So what should they do? How do they get InfoSight set up? Literally contact this, your support personnel, however you, you access support through HPE, and you can just register your existing systems. If you're under maintenance, which um, all of our customers have maintenance on their systems since that we're running their VMs and VM data. Uh, and if you're entitled and supported through the portal where you would access HPE support, you can register those systems and gain access to InfoSight. It's, just, it's the same model if you have HPE Nimble or any of our storage products and the same access portal through infosite.hpe.com where you'd access Infosite. Very nice. Yeah, sounds super easy to, to get set up and running. Um, I think that's all the time we have for our live questions, but it's been really great having you on today. Thank you so much, Chuck. All right. Thank you, Davis. Thank you, everyone. For more information on HPE SimpliVity, visit hpe.com slash SimpliVity. All right, great presentation there with Chuck. Uh, we do have a poll question for everyone out there in the audience. That question is on the screen. What additional info would you like about the HPE SimpliVity solution? 
Uh, I'll just leave that up there for a moment. Uh, we have three prizes coming up after each of the three presenters on today's event. I want to remind everyone about that. So we've got uh, three Amazon $500 gift cards. Uh, I don't have one to give away just yet, but we've got three, and, they, and we have three upcoming presenters. So it works out just perfectly. All right, thank you everyone for responding to that poll. If you haven't yet, I encourage you to get your uh, answer in on that one. All right, excellent, thank you everyone. And now it's time to introduce our next presenter on today's EcoCast. I'm excited to introduce Augie Gonzalez, Director of Product Marketing at DataCore. Augie, are you there? I am, David, how are you? I'm doing excellent. Thank you for being on. Take it away. Good. So the, the topic for our discussion today has a lot to do with modernization. A lot of the things that you're hearing throughout these ecocasts has to do with moving to new gear. And what uh, often goes unspoken when one does that is the level of effort to migrate data from one piece of equipment to another. So what I want to do is walk through that, especially if you've been in an environment where there's a number of storage silos that you're working through, and a mixed bag of those, and now you're in a situation where you're trying to replace some of that gear or expand on that gear. And that may be the case, one of the examples we run into quite frequently is a collection of distributed network attached storage and a bunch of filers that are where the people's key information is sitting. And that may be mixed in with a, a good batch of uh, storage area networks, a bunch of SANs, maybe even some new HCI clusters that are coming into the mix. And all of these represent small islands of data that are, tend to be compartmented, their own little sandboxes. And when you combine all of these and try to look at the different number of tools you're having to use to administer them, to take advantage or inability to take advantage of their mutual excess capacity, it, it does make you wonder what could you do to put those into a better use. Especially, uh, that's true from the IT perspective, but it's also true from the user's perspective. So they are having to suffer with the idea of having data scattered all over the place and trying to determine only if they know the location can they possibly arrive at the, the, the actual source file they're looking for. So one of the things that uh, we've seen is that from a data migration standpoint, there's a number of steps that are recommended. There's a pretty rigorous process to do that if you're doing it well, but that process usually is uh, either violated or short um, circumvented, it might be a good way to put it, and just uh, ad hoc kinds of moves. What we want to do is take um, a more disciplined approach to that and one that can be used on a recurring basis to take advantage of the resources at our disposal. So part of the proposal that I will be making to you today is the idea of a, using a federated approach or a pooling approach. That is, by pooling I mean collecting or aggregating a number of these storage resources that sit as in isolation and put them in a collective aggregated view. And then use software not only to create that pool, but also to balance the load across them. And I'll, and I'll walk through some diagrams on this shortly. The important element of this decision to federate the resources is also to be able to classify them into tiers because not all of those silos should be treated equally. There are some that may be pretty premium sized, uh, maybe some all flash arrays, some mid-range equipment, and some cheap and deep stuff. That's where you're putting some of your archive. So let's make collective sense of that and see how best to organize them. With that in mind, use a common control plane across them where these data services be, look uniform so that we can automate some of the movement be, be, between them. This is a, a pretty good picture of the kind of current state you might be in on the left and the proposed state on the right. So in the left, what we're seeing is the individual pieces of storage, whether those are individual NAS boxes or file servers or SANs. And what we are doing from the data core perspective is accumulating, pla placing those all under this common control plane, and then raising or up-leveling the functions that one uses to provision 
information from there, provision capacity from there, the ones, the tools that you would use to do data protection and migration apply uniformly across all of the members of that pool because they're basically treated as back-end resources. And this has the benefit of having a single view of your entire collection of gear and a number of other benefits. So uh, really important is that when you have these silos, there's usually some that have, that are like up, up to the, their necks in full of uh, files. Others may have quite a bit of vacancy. By pooling them, you're able to redistribute the capacity and put it all to use. So you, you can often defer buying some, some capacity as a result of that, pretty big chunks that can be freed up. You also tend to evacuate and, and vacate space on your most premium resources that may be used poorly. And that, in effect, will defer you from buying additional capacity and, and spending on more high-end gear. There's also the ability to take the perspective from that point on that storage devices are interchangeable. So let's, let's look at that in a little bit more detail in this next picture. Essentially, by having this software layer or virtualization of layer sitting between the consumers of storage and the place where the bits are held, we can play those games. We can set up these different tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three type storage, and at any time substitute the most desirable piece of gear for any of those tiers. So at one point, you may have a real favorite vendor, a, a favorite model from them that you like to do. Sometime in the future, you'd like to swap something out in its place because its useful life has expired. And we can make that transparent without disruption. So you can, you can move things in and out of here very quickly without disturbing the consumers. And those consumers may be coming in over file shares. In some cases, they're coming in as um, iSCSI or fiber channel connections. So either game, the Data Core offers solutions for both of those. In the process, the other thing that happens is the transparent migration of data from the premium resources to lower cost. So as the value of data decreases over time, because it ages or it simply goes unused, then there's no sense tying up your most precious assets to hold that information. Instead, we move it through an auto-tiering technique off to the lower cost storage, and eventually, if you need go ahead and archive it off to the cloud. This puts you in the unusually good bargaining position to select from competing alternatives without having concern about compatibility, mutual compatibility, or trying to, to match up with what you had before because these services are occurring at a higher level. And it also lets you add capacity pretty much on the fly when you need it. You don't have to buy ahead, you buy it on basically on, on demand, and better distribution of the volumes across your on-prem storage. So the, there's a little bit of a animation on this. This is one of the ways that you can go ahead and expand the environment effortlessly. So what you'll see is that we can bring in a new piece of gear into here. Nobody needs to know about it. We don't have to take any planned downtime to accomplish that. It simply says, hey, the pool has grown, I have a new capacity, and I also have a new, new level or new tier that I can drop that information into based on the policies that I've established. So some things that would have gravitated now from this tier one to tier two can do that seamlessly behind the scenes. A similar thing is the ability to choose. This choice that you have now is that your hands are no longer tied in terms of the best, using the best hardware for the job because you've distanced yourself from the nuances and the peculiarities of the individual hardware. The same is true when you're refreshing hardware, so you're replacing it. And that's often the thing that most of you are probably shopping for around right now is how do I modernize what I have and in the process, how do I clean out and reclaim or remove the data that I have on the other things without including in, encroaching on the users and having to disturb them. So this allows you that privilege. It allows you to go ahead and swap out stuff behind the scenes again. And here's a similar animation for that, 
where the software is, you basically tell the software, here's what I want to do. I'm, I have a new piece of gear that I've introduced into the pool. It's going to replace this other element that I had, which is flaw in the tooth now. So please evacuate the other one and move it where appropriate. Appropriate may mean part of those, those uh, files, for example, may be moving into the new piece of gear, but some of it may actually be redistributed across other parts of the pool based on the policies that we've established for the site and based on the aging and relevance that we talked about. And then at the point that that is complete, that that evacuation is complete, the software basically says, okay, what do you want to do with this now? You want to just go ahead and decommission it? Fine. And so it's removed. In this case, we have an Isilon NAS that we have had been a storage system inside the pool. We've decided that that uh, is no longer uh, valuable to us, so whatever it is. Maybe its, it's lease has expired. That may be one of the reasons it drives you there, or its useful financial life has exhausted. So at that point, we remove it. Its bits have been replaced, moved around to the appropriate buckets on other machines, and no one is the wiser for it. It's that straightforward, and that, that whole concern about migration and disruption and everything else goes away in this environment. The other thing that's occurring throughout this process is that we're unifying the tools that we are using. So the same technique that you're using to provision virtual volumes to protect against outages to your backups and your DR replication practices, those are constants irrespective of the make or model of the elements in the pool. I will clarify for those of you who might be looking at the, the minutia here, is that things, some of the device-specific components that you use, there may be consoles you still have to use to originally set up those, those individual members of the pool. And for any uh, detailed troubleshooting, the supplier of that may still use those tools. What we're talking about here is a control plane that deals at a higher level, the, the general provisioning and care and feeding of the overall infrastructure, not the individual devices. And to give you a better sense for that, there's a, this is a collection of the feature sets that's available through the DataCore's vFilo, Distributed File and Object Storage Virtualization product. And so it, you can see it deals with all the things that you're curious to do in a device independent fashion. So we can do out of place, and I'll show you a little bit about that, create the data mobility and load balancing. Load balancing, I think, is one of the really uh, hard ones to do in a silo environment. I know that in, in our own shop in the past, what we've had is the issue where file servers get full. They ask us to back them up and move them somewhere. Or they're going to have to relocate some of our shares some other places. And all that manual intervention is, is pretty uh, untenable at times. And, and so often what it leads to do is, hey, I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to have to buy another file share because I'm unwilling to go through that. With the product like vFilo, what you're able to do is basically say, put, I know how much capacity I have out there. Let me just distribute as new files get added to this mix. I know that which buckets have space on them, and I'll move it there. And I can also set upper limits on how full I'm willing to tolerate any one of these systems before I move somewhere else. So it kind of ping-pongs between the available resources. Through this collection of functions, then, we learn them once. We don't have to worry about when you bring in new gear, you're still using the same tool to provision, protect data, and to do your archives and things like that. And the automation engine remains intact. So you're not having to learn every new tool based on that, or that may no longer is a constraint on who you're shopping for. The added advantage of that is having much better visibility over the infrastructure, much better control over it at a macro level, as well as where the data is placed. So let's take a look at what the software does in that, in that behalf. And there's two, three, three really key functions here. Let me uh, jump ahead to some of the animations. What you have is a way to tell the software, basically, these are the policies or these are the objectives that I want based on characteristics of the data. So I can say, for example, this piece of data 
from the finance group should never leave this particular site. It should never be migrated anywhere else. However, I have a number of, let's say, MP4 files, video files, that if any of those we see that they haven't been touched in six months, let's move them to archive in the cloud. That's just a standard policy. Nobody has to be looking at it. The software is kind of your eye keeper for you, and it's watching behind the scenes when any of the those situations occur, it takes care of that data migration on your behalf without ever having to involve IT in the process, yet it remains in the catalogs. So you still see the file name. It's unlike other situations where you would archive something and then delete it from the file hierarchy, here it remains in place. And if you need to go get it, it's still there. It's just going to take a little bit longer to retrieve it because the software is going to have to go and rehydrate it from the cloud, bring it back over, and put it in the active space. A number of these can be also related to durability and, and high availability. So you can specify at a course level, or a, at what we call fuzzy level here, just simply say, look, I need five nines for some of this data. It's really critical, critical to the company. So make sure you're spreading it, copies of it, over multiple storage elements. And it just goes and does that. So you might be wondering some, how some of that happens, and it's, a lot of it has to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence working behind the scenes. The automation is not only on the data placement and tiering, but it also applies to how the software fails over should one of these systems go, go offline, whether it was intentional or it was unintentional. And all of that uh, activity happens, a lot of it happens in parallel. Now, how do you get the system in place initially, which would be, I'm sure, one of your questions. And that has to do with the assimilation. We call that assimilation. Assimilation basically says, I am going to layer the software on top of your existing resources. I'm going to take inventory of what I have back there, and I'm going to use the metadata there to create the Uber catalog. And from that point on, it becomes part of the pool. I don't actually have to move any data anywhere else. They all remain in place, and then I can choose when new equipment comes in to make those migrations. So the, the original picture for you may have looked something like this. This is the, the scattered, widely scattered data across multiple filers or NAS, where you have to have location knowledge in order to figure out where to search for information, and obviously the fragmentation of the, the file structure under the vFilo single namespace, all those appear as part of one global corporate chair, if you will, and you don't have to know anything about where the data is sitting, and the data may in fact be moving from bucket to bucket without you knowing it. So that should give you a pretty good idea of what we're up to, and uh, the next thing we want to do is just kind of give you, encourage you to either download a 30-day trial so you can see how this comes to use firsthand, or contact one of our solution architects for much more insights into it. Any questions on that, David? Absolutely, yeah, we do have some questions for you, Augie. So let's see, um, first question that came in, and while we do these questions, I'm just going to bring up the first of our poll questions, and that is, do you have an upcoming storage project coming up in the next, uh, and it's zero to six or seven to 12 months? Uh, we'll just leave that up while we do our first uh, question here. So uh, Michael is asking, uh, so encryption and deduplication and compression, uh, are those available with a third party, with third party storage options? They are. So that we, generally what we'll do is anything that, uh, there's basically two classifications for the data that you're using under vFilo, active data and inactive data. Inactive data, you, and you determine when something's considered inactive. So the inactive information normally would be pushed off to object storage and taking advantage of the native capabilities there. And on the way to pushing that out, whether it's on-prem object storage or cloud storage, we will dedupe, compress it, and encrypt that information, knowing that uh, performance there will not be a factor, and you want as much space reduction as you can in your archives, so it doesn't accumulate. Got it, okay, very nice. Uh, another question here, uh, Jeremy is asking, 
Uh, he said, this sounds great from a high level standpoint. How does this work for things like bad sectors on individual disks and the smaller management tasks? So th there's where I was talking about device management. Usually what happens is the native capabilities of the hardware will report some of these and they'll do bad sector relocating and things like that on their own. That's part of the intrinsic hardware value. We're dealing with the course level is I've got these resources that are either capable of doing that or not. In the cases where that equipment basically says, I can't deal with this, I fail, then what the software is going to do is going to say, one of my buckets is broken, I need to move, I'll have to rely on the other copy that I have somewhere else that's been safeguarded through redundancy. Okay, okay, that makes sense. All right, let's see, another question here. Um, what are the consequences of hardware failures since all the data goes through data core? How does that work? Okay, so that's the, the idea here. In all cases, the software has two copies that are active-active, running active-active. So in the case of any one of those nodes in effect that are front-ending the pool being out of service, the, the users will be redirected to the alternate, which is always active. So they're both normally load balanced across them. And then you can, when, when one should be shut down, the other one just naturally takes over all the duties. And you can also scale the number of front-end nodes that you're using here. So there is a, a, another level of scalability in terms of data movers and native NAS capabilities. Okay, okay, makes sense. Um, and you might have heard this one before. What's the pricing model? How does the pricing work? All of these products are based on terabytes of capacity in the pool that's exposed to us, so what we see after any raid or anything else that's happened, is that straightforward? And they're tiered, it's been, like I mentioned before, there's an active component, that's at one price, and then the inactive data is a lower price. It's obviously not as valuable. Oh, that's nice. I, I mean, I've heard of a number of you know storage solutions that are based on capacity utilization, but I don't think I've ever heard of one that's based on you know whether the data is used or not. So that's that's very innovative. Um, let me bring up this poll question for the audience, just as what additional info would you like about the data core solution? And we can leave that up while we do some more uh, questions here. So uh, James doesn't have a question, he said, but he wanted to comment that they have had data core and uh, like it for the last 10 years. So that's great to hear. Another Good to hear James. question. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to Another, see our new facility out here. We've got a new facility down in Fort Lauderdale and invite you to come over and see it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, another question here. Can you explain in more detail the process that drives where the data is placed? Yes. So that is the, what's the engine that drives that is given a number of hints. And they're basically the objectives you have as a, as a IT administrator, as the business to say, some things are more valuable than others, and I want different ways that that information should be placed across my infrastructure. So those things, you might say things like the uh, PDFs from a certain marketing department deserve a certain special treatment. And so let's, anytime you see a PDF that the owners or anybody in the marketing group, place them in this direction. That may be one thing. The other types of objectives are the ones that I mentioned related to availability. So I can, I can make Uber statements that are more casual statements about durability. There are certain files that are critical part of my web servers that I want to make sure they're replicated three, three places. And so you can establish that just as that easy. It's a, just a statement to that effect and the software will enforce that on your behalf. And it's always working. It's always reviewing for that criteria, and it's also looking at aging information. So it's, it's constantly probing, and part of the telemetry that it gets is also trying to identify how the back-end resources are behaving. So there's a performance metric as well. That performance metric would say, I have some really fast stuff in the back-end, and I have some medium and slow stuff. So if somebody's telling me I want to prioritize this for fast, I will always move those types of files to my fastest devices, and conversely for the others.
David, did that answer your question? That does, yes. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> um, James followed up by saying that they've never had an outage in 10 years, and he has been to your Florida training facility uh, eight years back. So uh, good feedback. Always good to hear that from existing customers. Um, let's see, another question we've got for you here, and that is, uh, why wouldn't we just buy one big NAS and migrate everything there instead of uh, continuing continuing with different buckets of data? <laughs> yes, why wouldn't you? Uh, probably one reason is you couldn't afford that big of NAS in most cases, given some of the data center complexity and the, the, uh, the cost to do that. The second part of that is it's just on a more practical basis is that the moment you exhausted that NAS and you had to spill over, you'd have to have a huge capital expenditure just to get the next chunk of similar capability. And then now you're in a situation where you basically have two split namespaces and now you're back into the silos again. The, the, uh, the third reason, David, would be that you don't have the benefit of that tiered view that we're trying to talk about because generally what you find is that the more sophisticated environments are basically saying, I've got to partition off my data. I know that I can't pay the same price per terabyte or price per gigabyte for all my data. I'd go, I'd go broke. So I need to have different uh, steps of cost and price performance to distinguish that. The only way to do that is get different gear. So one big NAS wouldn't do that for you. It would all have one big price tag. Uh, okay, okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Well, cool. Well, Augie, that's all the time we have for our Q&A session here, but it's been really great having you on. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Bye. And thank you to DataCore for supporting today's event. Uh, thank you to Augie for the great presentation. For more information, of course, visit datacore.com. Give the solution a try for yourself. And also check out the handout that's available for download in your audience console. And now it's time to award our first gift card winner. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Mark Schaub from Illinois. Congratulations, Mark Schaub from Illinois. Uh, two more gift cards still to give away on today's event. All right. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our next presenter on today's EcoCast. That is Andre Franklin, Product Marketing Director at Cohesity. Andre, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for being on the event. Take it away. Okay, well, uh, thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to come back to this forum again. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to talk for several minutes about what we'll call new concepts in file and object services. Uh, yes, there are new concepts in file and object services. I know NAS, file, object, it's been around for quite a long time. Uh, some people say that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, that may be true. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can always get a new dog and teach that new dog new tricks. And I think what we've done with uh, some things at Cohesity is we have a new dog, and this dog has new tricks, there are new concepts, and I'd like to talk to you about that uh, as we look at a few things over the next several minutes. I think we all know this. Uh, data is growing like crazy. Uh, sometimes we don't actually have a number that we're putting on it, but we feel it when we buy more uh, storage shelves, when we're buying more disk and capacity, um, when we're deploying more hardware and infrastructure, uh, we feel it in our budgets, we feel it in management effort, uh, we feel it in a number of ways. Uh, we feel it when uh, we run out of capacity for a given silo and we create another silo. Um, Gartner says that by 2024 enterprises will triple their unstructured data stored as file and object from what they they've had in 2019. Uh, I would concur, um, and I would like to think that if you're involved in managing file and object, uh, you've seen some of this as well. 
what that means is that all the challenges that you face are they're multiplied. They're multiplied by, by the kind of growth that you're experiencing. Um, there are uh, what I'll call traditional NAS environments that have, uh, I'll call them traditional architectures, traditional functionality. We're going to call that legacy NAS uh, for this discussion and talk about the way things are today. Now, this doesn't mean your environment is exactly like this. Uh, we're kind of uh, making this generic and talking about legacy NAS in a very generic manner. There are people trying to access files. Uh, there are also applications accessing files and file data. Uh, they're doing it across uh, SMB and Windows environments. They're doing it across NFS. And um, then we have machines that are accessing data, writing data, reading data, and so on. This could be IoT. This could be apps that, that write uh, as objects. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's a need to write objects through a gateway. And that gateway will allow you to write these objects into your storage. Or alternatively, you could, have, you could deploy dedicated object storage that may be separate from your, your NFS and um, SMB storage. Uh, in either case, whether there's an object gateway or whether you're writing directly to a, a dedicated, separated object storage environment, there is an object aspect that has to be addressed uh, by these uh, machine applications, I'll call them here. And also you'll see in this diagram there's an external app infrastructure. That app infrastructure can include a variety of things. Uh, I'm going to call it an, uh, a file ecosystem. Uh, you need to protect your file environment with some sort of antivirus uh, applications. Uh, many are subject to compliance in these file environments, uh, personal identifiable information and other kinds of things you're, you're checking for. Uh, there could be a need to have uh, analytics on the data. Uh, that could be Splunk in some cases. And then many are uh, trying to tier the data to a tier two or tier three to be more cost effective. And also to, uh, to free up data from, from tier one NAS. So, uh, I mean, this is kind of the, the typical environment that you might see in a legacy environment. Uh, you can also find uh, uh, in a connectivity to the cloud, and that's often done through a cloud gateway. So here you've got object gateways, cloud gateways. You've got a, a, um, a NAS ecosystem that's running on separate infrastructure. Uh, it's running on its own antivirus servers or compliance servers and so on. And, and your data management and tiering running on separate hardware. So we'd like to talk about the new concepts that and we address this in a product, a solution, I should say, that we call Cohesity Smart Files. This is our new dog, if you will. And uh, these new concepts, let me go through some of this here. Again, take another last look at this diagram, object gateways, cloud gateways, and this whole ecosystem. Because that's going to, to disappear as we go through this. Now you'll see already that the object gateway and the cloud gateway is gone. Uh, we feel that the new concepts in file and object storage incorporates these things. They should not be separate. They should be under the same GUI, uh, same platform. Uh, you shouldn't have to buy separate gateways to manage and scale and so on. So Cloud Gateway gone, Object Gateway is gone, and there's a single data platform here for um, apps that are writing um, object, uh, SMB, or NFS. And, and in fact, uh, 
the new concept here is that the protocols don't even matter. I mean, you could write as NFS, read as SMB. Uh, the permissions across the file uh, domain is, is honored. Uh, you could write as NFS, but maybe you need to read it as S3, and so on. So uh, the protocols don't really matter in this new environment. And then you've got this external app infrastructure. Well, that goes away as an external infrastructure. Let's go back here. That goes away as an external infrastructure. And it's actually brought into the Cohesity Smart Files environment such that you don't have external application infrastructure. It actually all runs within the Cohesity Smart Files environment. So integrated antivirus, integrated compliance, integrated analytics. Yes, you can run Splunk uh, within this environment. Uh, and integrated data management and tiering. Um, also, there's no need for the, the cloud gateway. So that's all integrated. We were having a little problem with the animation in this slide, but this is what we're really talking about here. Uh, the antivirus compliance analytics and data management is all integrated into the platform. No cloud gateways, no object gateways, no external infrastructure. So at the end of the day, what you've got is files and objects but with Cohesity, we actually build the files and objects into an, an overall data management platform. So uh, you can have data protection backup. You could have disaster recovery. You can have integration with the cloud. You can actually even run the data platform in the cloud. Uh, so either running it in the cloud or connect, connecting to the cloud, either way, it doesn't really matter. So so one of the new concepts is not just files and objects as a, in a consolidated way that eliminates infrastructure that would normally be external, but it's putting it all in a platform that gives you all the data management elements that you need to protect your data, to interface with the cloud, to run in a hybrid environment without gateways, and so on. So, this modernizes your backup and recovery. It allows for consolidation. It really allows you to embrace the public cloud and eliminates what we call mass data fragmentation. So let's talk a little bit about the, these new concepts that we've introduced with the Smart File solution. Uh, first of all, there's freedom of choice. Now, I, I've spoken to many customers that they're not even really sure of their strategy for two years, three years, five years downstream. But what they are sure about is they want the flexibility to do what they need to do. They don't want to buy or commit to something today when that solution may not be there for them tomorrow. Well, a lot of the legacy solutions don't really give you that kind of flexibility. There's hardware vendor lock-in. Uh, you cannot deploy it anywhere you want. You can't deploy it in the cloud. Uh, you can't deploy it on your choice of hardware and so on. And not that smart files can be deployed on any hardware. There's, you know, hardware has to be qualified, if you will. But the ability to run in any standard qualified hardware, um, and uh, just having software-defined flexibility so that whatever you decide to do in the future, you can do it, whether you're running it in the cloud or running it on other hardware or so on, and, and being able to match hardware to uh, specific workloads. Broad compatibility. One of the things I pointed out earlier of the new concepts that we've introduced with smart files is that protocols really shouldn't matter anymore. 
I mean, whether it's a mixed Windows, Linux, or Unix environment, a hybrid cloud environment, it really shouldn't matter. Uh, the new concepts are that these protocols should be uh, integrated, the permissions should be addressed across these protocols. It should be seamless, it should be under the same uh, UI, and um, it should all just simply be seamless regardless of protocol. So there's no protocol complexity. Uh, you can accelerate hybrid and cloud strategies because of this integration of the, the multiple protocols. And obviously, there's no object gateway cost. Migration can be complex, automation can be difficult, and um, many customers I've talked to have multiple silos, sometimes multiple vendors that create multiple silos, and so on. Um, we're proposing what I'll just call click and go ease, uh, a single point of management across sites and clouds. So not just across the data center, single point of management for all file and object services, but across multiple sites and even with the cloud. Uh, give an example of that. Let's say that you're trying to find a certain file and you don't know where it is on your site. In fact, you don't even know if it's on, at another site. In fact, you don't even know if it's in your AWS or Azure cloud. You can do a search across all of that, an enterprise search across all of that, and find that file. So uh, it's a Google-like search, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but just the click and go ease that you have with the newer, modern file and object types of solutions. Uh, that's what we're trying to, to, to deliver to customers. Uh, lastly, let me just point out here is that um, there's always a place for different types of NAS. I don't want to say that there isn't. There is. There could be a tier one NAS. Maybe it needs extremely low sub-millisecond latency and so on. But at the same time, a lot of times those files don't need to remain on that tier one NAS forever. After 30 days or 60 days or six months or whatever, and maybe it's more appropriate to move that to a more cost-effective tier. You should be able to do that in a stress-free manner, in an automated way, policy-driven, and so on. And this is the kind of thing that Smart Files supports. Now, we talked about applications running on the platform. Um, typically, what I see when I talk to customers that have a antivirus environment is they're running it on a separate antivirus server. Uh, that server has to be managed. Uh, that server has to scale with the NAS environment. Uh, the antivirus software could be running on ICAP servers and so on, and that ICAP server farm has to scale with the NAS environment. Amongst the new concepts that we are addressing with smart files is that you can run the antivirus software right on the file and objects platform. And so it automatically scales as your file and object environment scales. Uh, there's no external hardware infrastructure to be concerned about. It's all just the file and objects hardware platform that you're dealing with. So less hardware, less management, and we have the ability uh, with some of these apps you can see inside the data, uh, crack open the files, uh, understand what the content really is in those files. You can use this to drive uh, data-driven services and processes and so on. So uh, it's not just integration, but it's being smart about it, allowing the data to be accessible and usable to drive your, your processes and uh, services and so on. Everybody addresses cybersecurity in some way or another. Uh, I don't want to pretend like we're the only ones that, that do it. We're not. A lot of good security out there. 
But one of the things that we find is that cybersecurity seems to be an option in the legacy environment. In other words, you have to buy it separately, you have to deploy it separately, you have to architect your own cybersecurity solution. Uh, of the new concepts that we're introducing here is that it's just simply all built in. Uh, you deploy our product, you've got multiple layers of cybersecurity cyber already there. You don't have to be an expert in cybersecurity because that expert is built in, if you will. And, and when I say multiple layers, I'm talking about uh, software encryption end-to-end. -end. I'm talking about multi-factor authentication. Uh, we have um, built-in uh, ransomware functionality in, in the product. And uh, it's all with the simplicity of a single UI. So um, without being an expert in cybersecurity, you can get that. Uh, this is analogous to uh, <laughs> You want to buy that BMW 7 Series car. Well, they don't ask you, uh, would you like brakes with that? Uh, would you like tires with that? Well, safety is, should never be an option. It should come with the car. And that's the way we view our product. Cybersecurity comes with it. It's built in. Um, and uh, it's really that simple. Uh, you, you don't have to use it, but why not when it's... Uh, full, rich, robust, multi-layered, and so on. So it's just one less worry for IT uh, in case uh, cybersecurity is cumbersome. Um, it, it's all there for you in, in this solution. Google-like search, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Search any data anywhere, your site, multiple sites across the cloud, and so on. Uh, and you can search for the kind of information that would keep you in compliance with your corporate policies. Um, you could search for e-discovery purposes or there's a court order to find certain information. Um, we make it as simple as Google searching, uh, doing a Google search. Uh, enter your search terms, uh, results come back. Uh, no need for like tedious file searches, multiple iterations of searches across the different silos that you may have and the different sites that you may have and so on. Now, I mean, some of this functionality to level with you, it may require our Helios web-based management console, but you can do it, and you can do it quite easily and quickly in a Google-like manner. Low-cost storage. Now, who wouldn't want? Who wants high-cost storage? <laughs> Nobody that I know of. Uh, we like to say that with smart files, less is more. You can store more of your data on the same given amount of hardware, and it's because of multiple technologies that we deploy: um, advanced sliding window, variable DDoS, uh, compression. Uh, we find that some of the legacy vendors, they forget about small file optimization, where you could store, say, you know, a, a terabyte of small files, but on the hard disk, it takes up 10 terabytes because those files aren't stored efficiently. They're not stored in an optimized manner. Uh, some refer to this as a small file amplification penalty. Well, we address that where there's virtually no amplification penalty at all. But not only that, when you store files across the data center, you could have silos in your data center in which even though a file may be, you know, compressed and very, maybe it's an MP4 file, whatever, um, but you've got multiple copies of that file in your data center from different departments, you name it. Well, the ability to dedupe across the silos in the data center, across the volumes, the application of volumes in your data center, that can save a substantial amount of storage. And so we have addressed that too, so that you are deduping across multiple volumes. So you've got two or three copies of something that maybe can't be compressed much, but you've got two or three copies of it. Well, why not just have one?
any file and object services product for the enter for enterprise needs to have a lot of richness, a lot of knobs and buttons. Um, it needs to be able to address the specific kinds of things that you need in your environment. Uh, we built in those kinds of things into the Smart Files environment. Uh, it's not just the multi-protocol and um, Active Directory and LDAP and, and local admin groups and so on, and, and the built-in data protection and the efficiency, but uh, there's the security, there's the data management quotas. Um, you can uh, tier to the cloud. Um, you have writable snapshots so that you can actually um, have a clone, clone your data and write to it. Um, so the multi-tier data management, sometimes this is a separate product that people are using to tier seamlessly to a lower cost storage tier. That's all built in. And, uh, and this is all API driven to make it easy to automate uh, and manage. So this slide is not intended to be read, uh, just um, throwing it out there to see that there are a lot of, there's a lot of richness and functionality that, that we've uh, added to this solution. The kinds of workloads that we find uh, this is well suited for, uh, your content management and digital archives, corporate video, uh, video surveillance, uh, spunk cold buckets, um, all your audio and video uh, files, uh, audio logs, uh, active archives, passive archives, and so on, corporate communications, and so on. We find that customers are using uh, smart files in a, a wide variety of ways. And so I'm just showing this here so that you get a sense of the kind of workloads that uh, smart files is designed for. And lastly, the kind of vertical industries that have these kinds of use cases and have adopted us in a very big way is uh, healthcare, uh, PACS archives for the healthcare, law firms and some of the co collaboration kinds of things and e-discovery that they do, uh, state, local, and education, uh, life sciences, genomics analysis, and so on, and financial services, um, images and documents, call logs, correspondence, and that kind of thing. Uh, there's more to this list, but I'm just highlighting a few of the industries that uh, have really adopted smart files in a big way. So in summary, why Cohesity smart files? Well, first of all, it's the software-defined freedom. Uh, have it your way. Is that what McDonald's said? <laughs> have it your way. Uh, and even if you don't know what you want to do in the future, that software-defined gives you the freedom and flexibility to do that in the cloud or on a variety of industry standard hardware. Broad compatibility such that protocols really don't matter. Uh, integrated apps to eliminate a lot of the NAS ecosystem infrastructure that may be costing a lot of management effort and money. Uh, integrated cybersecurity for peace of mind and, and ease of deployment. Global space efficiency for very, very low storage costs. Stress-free operations with click and go ease. And lastly, just global actionable search that's Google-like and allows you to find the kinds of things very quickly. So with that, um, that's the end of this presentation. I can entertain some questions at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Great presentation, Andre. Uh, we do have some questions for you. While we do those, I'm going to bring up this poll question for everyone out there in the audience, and let's just leave it up there while we do some Q&A. So um, first question that came in, they're asking about, uh, basically, let's clear up some confusion. Is, is CoheCD a hardware solution, or is it software only? Do they install it on their own hardware? How, does it run in the cloud? How does that work? That's a very good question. CoheCD is a software product period, end of story. That said, uh, we do work with hardware. We're partners with uh, HPE running on ProLiant and uh, 
Apollo uh, Hardware. Uh, we're partners with Cisco, running on Cisco UCS servers. We run on Dell servers. And we also offer our own Cohesity hardware for those customers that just haven't found a fit with other hardware available. And some customers want, you know, one phone call to Cohesity for hardware and software. So um, we support that with our own hardware as well, but this is a software-only product. Got it, got it, okay. And then another question here, are there advantages to using Cohesity Data Protect for backup with, with smart files? What's the advantage there? Well, one of the advantages is that it's all in the same platform. I mean, it's a single UI, um, and it's real easy to um, uh, use the two together. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the two together is you can do a backup, for instance, and then you can take that backup and you can clone it as a volume. So um, you know, and there's your you know quick, easy data migration. <laughs> it's often you know something that you have nightmares about when you think about migration. But in in this case, using the two together, you can do a backup, and which is pretty easy and then just transferring it to becoming a volume, and your data migration is done. So uh, there are a number of advantages. Uh, so uh, thanks for asking that question. Okay. Okay, nice. Um, can I run primary NAS workloads with smart files? Absolutely. Um, that's what most of our customers are doing. Um, there are limitations. I mean, we're not an HPC. Uh, system. So uh, for that, you might want to call Panassis or someone else. Uh, we're, we don't pretend to be HPC. Uh, we're not your sub millisecond latencies and for those applications that really need that. But at the same time, there are some apps that really do need that, but yet they don't need the sub millisecond latency for you know weeks or months after the data is stored. So we allow a seamless migration of the data to a more cost-effective Cohesity tier. And the apps don't know the difference. The apps still continue to run, no problem at all. But yet at the end, your tier one uh, sub-millisecond uh, NAS is freed up of costly storage. And, um, and then you're storing that data on, on a lot more costly, cost, a cost-effective tier on Cohesity. Okay, okay, very nice. Uh, and then what about scalability? I mean, how large does this scale up to? And, and also kind of on the other side of that question, where does this start? Like how do, what's this, if I wanted, you know, to implement something relatively small, uh, what size would I, would that be minimally? Uh, our minimum configuration is three nodes. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, terabytes that that equates to, but it's not a lot of terabytes. Um, as for the, the upper end of scale, um, I don't even know if Cohesity knows the limits because no one's ever tested it that far. We had an independent uh, analyst go to 256 nodes uh, with no degradation in uh, performance and a complete linearity of performance with capacity out to 256 nodes. There's no architectural limit. This is a fully distributed um, scale-out uh, file and object systems. With uh, There's no master-slave relationships. There's no bottlenecks of, of any kind. So um, the limit is really the, your hardware budget. <laughs> How much hardware do you, can you buy? Uh, there's no real scalability limits that we know of in terms of, of that. And in fact, you could even have a single file that's the uh, size of a cluster. You could have a file that's, you know, 10 terabytes, 20 uh, gigabytes, uh, you know, a petabyte file. Uh, we really don't have the kind of limits that you would expect in a traditional NAS. Very nice. That's cool. Uh, well, I mean, I guess final question I have for you is, how should people get started with Cohesity? What's typically the first step? Uh, well, I think the first step is to uh, contact Cohesity on uh, Cohesity.com. 
And uh, with no pressure or anything, we can simply explain what we do and um, lay it all out for you, not just the smart files, but the whole platform, the data protection side, uh, replication and DR, uh, how we can run in the cloud and or interface with the cloud, tier to the cloud, um, and, and use this to help uh, implement whatever strategies you have in mind. Just let us explain it to you in a no pressure way. I think that would really be the best way to get started. Okay. Okay. Sounds easy to do. Uh, well, Andre, I think that's all the time we have for our live Q&A, but it's been great having you on the event today. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to Cohesity for supporting today's event. For more information, check out the handout that's available for download there in your audience console. That is the Cohesity Smart Files Solution Brief, where it covers how to scale out uh, beyond NAS with smart files. And of course, also visit Cohesity.com for more information. And now it's time for our next prize winner. Uh, we have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Joe Rinella from Missouri. Congratulations, Joe Rinella from Missouri. And we've got one more gift card to give away after our next presentation. And speaking of which, I'm excited to introduce our next presenter on today's EcoCast. That is Laura Giordana, Technical Marketing Engineer at Nutanix. Take it away, Laura. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Giordana and I'm a Technical Marketing Engineer with Nutanix. And today I wanted to talk about secondary storage. More specifically, how can we consolidate and simplify secondary storage? Secondary storage is one of those things that's a huge part of a company's data footprint. It's all that data that may not be used frequently or at all, but it's data that's required to be kept around for a long period of time and needs to be protected. It's often referred to as dark data as no one seems to know where it lies, how to retrieve it, and most importantly, how to derive any insights from this data. This makes secondary data just a costly liability rather than the digital asset that it could be. So why is this data so difficult to manage? Let's talk a little bit about legacy backup infrastructure and some of the pain points around it. One thing we consistently hear from our customers and partners is this notion that legacy infrastructure is difficult, especially when you are thinking about business goals. You're being pressured by the business to make sure you're meeting these backup windows, that you're meeting SLAs for recovering data, and you're having challenges doing so. And why are there challenges? Well, traditional backup is complex and siloed. It can be difficult to set up and manage dealing with licensing and renewals for different areas. And it's not uncommon for organizations to be leveraging more than one backup vendor across aging infrastructure that is aging at different rates. And some of our customers and partners have even joked that they need a PhD to manage their backup. This leads to silos, not only on the infrastructure side, but now we have different teams managing different areas of the infrastructure. And all these pain points mean that IT is mostly focused on just keeping the lights on and making sure these backups are, are functioning without much room for innovation or growth. And even if they needed to scale out the environment, they're most likely at some point having to introduce another silo because the existing infrastructure has been maxed out. So what we really need is a cloud-like environment. And one of the key benefits of the cloud is the simplicity and the agility that it provides. It's a true pay-as-you-grow experience. You're not having to forecast what your growth and needs are going to be in the next five years and buy infrastructure and hope that your forecast was correct. You just buy what you need today, and if you need to add more capacity or resources, you simply just pay for more and your environment grows on the fly. So the Nutanix vision was really to bring that cloud-like experience on-prem into the data center. We wanted to take all the disparate pieces of the data center, reduce the number of silos, and converge it all into a simple, easy-to-manage platform that is easily scalable and offers predictable performance. So instead of these separate silos of storage, the physical storage controllers, your servers and your network, you instead have a cluster of servers with locally attached storage, CPU and memory that is imaged with the Nutanix software, which pools all of the storage from each node and presents it as a single shared namespace for you to run your virtualized workloads. We do that by deploying a virtual storage controller on each node to handle the IO. And so as we add nodes, we're just adding another virtual storage controller on each node so we're getting that predictable performance. We're not bottlenecked by you know, two or more storage controllers. 
The hardware itself is just commodity servers with locally attached storage that can be in the form of both SSDs and HDDs. There's no specialized hardware. Our software that's running on our virtual storage controllers is what's pooling all of the storage together and providing things like data tiering between hot and cold tiers and features such as compression, encryption, erasure coding, and much more, all built into the stack. And then how do we manage all this? So we have an integrated HTML5 interface called Prism that's also running as part of the virtual storage controller across every node. And this makes it high, highly available. And Prism reduces laborious, time-intensive IT tasks to just a few clicks. So you're able to add nodes to a cluster, non-disruptively upgrade not only the Nutanix software, the hypervisor, the firmware, and BIOS, view your management uh, stats, your metrics, you know, see the VMs running, etc all from within this interface. And if we go back and, and you're talking about backup and look at the, the complexity there, that same complexity exists when we're talking about our secondary infrastructure or backup storage. So we have our backup servers, we have our app servers, our data movers, this disparate environment that is siloed and complex. And as I mentioned, it's not uncommon for IT organizations to leverage four or five different backup solutions siloed across dozens of different locations in aging infrastructure. This adds both cost and complexity to managing these point solutions for backup, archival, target, storage, and long-term retention tiers. And again, that same complexity exists when we're talking about secondary or backup storage. We have our backup servers, our app servers, our data movers. We have this disparate environment that is siloed and complex. As I mentioned, it's not uncommon for IT organizations to leverage four or five different backup solutions siloed across dozens of different locations in aging infrastructure. So this adds both cost and complexity to managing these point solutions for backup, archival, target storage, and long-term retention tiers. So to solve all these challenges, we are introducing Nutanix Mine. With Nutanix Mine, we're extending our core strength of Nutanix AOS software that we've built for the past 10 years, and we're extending that to the secondary storage space. So Mine is tightly integrated with our core data fabric and Prism Management Console. This means that for the first time, data center managers are now able to rely on a single pane of glass to manage their primary storage as part of the HCI infrastructure, as well as their secondary storage for data backup. The backup vendor software, in this case a GA, we're running with Veeam and Haiku, the software is running in a hyper-converged manner on Nutanix Core AOS. So it's an entirely self-sufficient turnkey solution providing compute, memory, and storage, and now backup. Nutanix Mine is able to backup VMs and application data from both Nutanix as well as non-Nutanix environments. So now IT organizations can modernize their current data center without having to rip and replace everything. It can fit in with what is already there. So the key benefits that Nutanix Mine offers, firstly, is unifying IT operations. So customers that care about simplicity and scale, and as a result are drawn towards hyperconverged infrastructure, are now able to adopt a similar approach to address their backup and archiving needs. You're able to use a single pane of management across primary and secondary environments for deployment as well as data management. You also have the freedom of choice, so from the choice of hardware to the choice of backup software. So at GA, you're having the option to run with Veeam or Haiku with other vendors on the roadmap. Faster time to value. So one of the design goals for Nutanix Mine was to have an improved customer experience for sizing and ordering, deploying, everything. I'll talk a little bit more about deployment in the architecture slide, but from a sizing and ordering perspective, what we've done is select two run-of-the-mill Nutanix appliance models as the building blocks and optimize the specs of this appliance for running the data protection software. So we've preset the configuration in terms of CPU, memory, and networking, and have boosted the available storage capacity as much as we can. So in the first release, we'll have a small and a medium version. The small version is based on the NX 1465 form factor that takes up two U of rack space on four nodes, and will provide about 100 terabytes of available storage for backups. And then the medium model, which is based on the NX 8235 model, delivers about 200 terabytes in four rack units. And both these form factors start as a four node cluster, but of course can be scaled out horizontally by adding additional nodes. This not only increases the available storage capacity, but the processing power of the new nodes since we're adding additional compute and memory, which will allow the backup jobs to run in parallel, allow more backup jobs to run in parallel. 
And the second part of making sizing easy is adding the support for our Nutanix sizing tool. So Nutanix Sizer is aware of Nutanix Mine. So adding backup to your primary workloads is as easy as selecting the checkbox that says, yes, I want to back this up to Nutanix Mine. This automatically selects the right form factor and adds the required hardware and software SKUs to the bill of materials. And that brings me to you know, making it easy to order. So the bill of materials generated will include a standard amount of licenses for the backup software. And we've worked with the distributors and the, the partners to bundle everything up into a single SKU for the appliance that includes the hardware, the AOS software, and the backup software. And then of course, this is all supported fully from both Nutanix and the backup partner. And you can call either company for issues in whichever part of the solution has, has an issue. And if necessary, we can transfer cases between the companies very quickly and efficiently. And lastly, the ability to expand your existing secondary infrastructure with a consolidated platform that provides everything you need in terms of a compute and storage and the software and, and, and all that. And you're able to start small and, and scale that out as needed. So let's dig into mine in a bit more detail. So again, mine is an integrated data protection solution that we're building together with our ecosystem partners. It's leveraging the strengths of the core AOS software by Nutanix that we've built for the past 10 years and integrates with the data protection software from Veeam and Haiku so that their software runs in a hyperconverged manner on the appliance itself. So it's an entirely self-sufficient appliance providing compute, memory, storage, and backup. And to deploy the solution, what we've done is we've developed an extension of our existing deployment tool, which we call Nutanix Foundation. What Nutanix Foundation does is it takes the hardware and it images the nodes with the Nutanix software. What we've added is the ability to turn the standard Nutanix deployment into a full-blown mine appliance in just a matter of minutes. So it deploys all the necessary infrastructure to run the data protection software on the appliance. It's installing the VMs, the backup software, it's configuring the storage, it's setting up the networking based on your inputs in terms of VLANs and IP addresses, and then it's actually applying all the best practices that are already documented in our best practice guides and also some best practices that we have discovered through intensive joint testing with our partners in terms of performance, making sure availability is set correctly, and so on. The solution is using the local storage provided and optimized by the Nutanix appliance as the backup target. And because the data protection software is the regular commercial version, it can back up any workload it supports. So that this means that this solution is not just for your Nutanix workloads, you're able to replace your old backup infrastructure with a mine appliance to protect your entire data center. It also extends the PRISM capabilities. So we've added a new plugin into the dashboard that will show info from both the data protection stack as well as from the AOS stack. So you'll see things like available storage capacity, throughput, networking speeds, and hardware status, as well as backup job throughput, job status, making sure SLAs are met, and things like that ensuring that we're able to successfully still do backups and restores, focusing on you know, things like capacity. The performance and throughput of the solution are optimized to handle the incoming backup workloads. So during beta testing, we actually had people report that they saw a tremendous increase in backup performance over their normal environments. So like I said, you can backup any workload onto the mine appliance and keep that around for a few months. So it's very, very easy and very fast to access the backups you created. And you can leverage functionality like Veeam Instant Recovery to recover your workloads and your data in a matter of seconds. If your company has regulatory requirements to keep your backups for an even longer period of time, you can tier off the backups to another tier of storage. This tiering is done using the backup software to convert the backups into objects and store them onto an S3 compatible location. So this can either be a cloud-based offering like AWS S3 or something in your own data center like a Nutanix objects cluster. Nutanix Objects is a fully tested and certified backup target for archival. So for a quick sneak peek into the, the mine dashboard, so this is a beta version of the dashboard, but you can see that it extends our PRISM capabilities into the backup environment. So we're able to see things related to our infrastructure itself. So we can see things like uh, the hardware alerts, uh, if there's any drive failures and things like that as well as backup specific information, such as how many protected instances we have, which ones are Nutanix VMs, which ones are other VMs or physical hosts even. We can get stats on our backup jobs. So it's giving us this visibility into our mine appliance 
And of course, by leveraging Prism Central, which can manage multiple Nutanix clusters and systems, you'd be able to see your primary workloads from this interface as well. Now, I talked earlier about how you can use the backup software running on mine to tier data to S3 storage. And again, this includes Nutanix Objects, which is our on-prem S3 compatible object storage solution. So to drill a little deeper into objects, again, building off that same core AOS stack, which we've built different data services into. So when we first introduced HCI in 2011, we were providing seamless scale out storage for running your virtual machines. So we eliminated the complexities of managing those separate SANs and servers and consolidated it down to an easily scalable solution using commodity hardware. So you were able to get all the benefits of virtualization without all the pain and complexity of managing SANs and LUNs. And so since then, we've branched out to different use cases. So things like files, which provides an NFS and SMB filer, a scale out filer on top of that core AOS stack. Nutanix volumes, which is used when an iSCSI target is needed. And now with Nutanix objects, we're providing scalable S3 based object storage. But under the covers, you're still benefiting from all the benefits of Nutanix, such as that single click simplicity, the single pane of glass with Prism. These are managers as services within the same uh, familiar PRISM interface. So for example, objects is just exposed as another module within PRISM. So again, you're able to leverage a single platform to provide these different services and bring the same level of simplicity to your primary infrastructure that we brought with the pr uh, PRISM and the Nutanix stack, and bringing that same level of simplicity to your secondary infrastructure, all from the same platform and interface. So why object storage? What was our goal with objects? Again, it was really to help bring secondary data into that fold instead of having that separate silo. Objects are immutable, which make them ideal for archives and long-term retention. We're supporting the S3 protocol, so it's a popular industry standard, well-documented. We're supporting the most common S3 APIs and having that global namespace collaboration. So having that data available at any place just as you can easily access data in the public cloud, it should be easily accessible in a private cloud. And so the three primary use cases that we targeted with the GA version of objects uh, are DevOps, long-term retention, and backups. Essentially, any application that can talk S3 is a valid use case for objects. And mine is a perfect fit for this because Nutanix objects can be leveraged as a tier for mine. So for example, if you are running mine with Veeam, you have your primary backup data on, v on mine for instant restore, and Veeam can tear off colder data to an S3 target, such as Nutanix objects, for archive and long-term retention. So to talk about some of the features that we've developed for Nutanix objects that apply to each of these use cases, and it's important to note that these features are the same across all use cases. So for example, S3 compatibility, we wanted to provide that S3 compatibility because it's a very well-documented interface. Uh, it's become the industry standard in the, in the past few years. Uh, a lot of vendors have you know, added S3 support to their products, including our backup vendors. So that makes it an ideal protocol to, to build against. Simple deployment and fast upgrades, so keeping in line with the same constructs that we've always done with AOS itself, making things one click, making things simple is something we, we kept in mind as we were developing Nutanix objects. We're following the AWS S3 IAM functionality where you're able to generate access and secret keys for a particular user or application. So we've developed this IAM uh, platform that follows this functionality. So when you're creating an object store, all you have to do is create a, an access and secret key pair, and that's all the end user application needs to leverage the object store. They don't need to go into Prism or, or do anything from a management perspective. It's all done within that third party application. We've also uh, integrated a native load balancer to eliminate uh, additional layer of complexity or an additional uh, you know, third party um, layer into the architecture. And then of course we have things like metrics in terms of performance and gets and puts and throughput, et cetera. For security, 
Uh, we're following the worm standard, so write once, read many. So you can apply worm to a bucket, which means that any data or object placed in that bucket would not be able to be deleted or modified until the retention period ha has been met. So not even a Nutanix admin or a Nutanix employee or anybody will be able to reverse the policy or delete any items in that bucket. We've also incorporated lifecycle policies. So if we're dealing with billions of objects, trying to manage these objects you know, manually would be near impossible. So being able to set rules and define when an object should expire based on the, the lifecycle policy is really key here. So you can define when to expire off current objects or versions in the system. And then we've also, um, you know, we have native encryption with the Nutanix stack and we're able to leverage that data at rest encryption. And we also have HTTPS support. So we're also encrypting that data in flight. So it can be a complete end to end secure solution. And then of course, things like object versioning, uh, which protects the data as well. And then on the backup side, so our backup vendors and, and, and backup software traditionally, you know, chunks data. So when they're doing backups, the, the VMs and the application data is chunked off. And so this can become very small objects. So the ability to support small objects uh, is something we've incorporated into our metadata layer. And of course, also the ability to scale to billions of objects. So we want to be able to handle uh, you know, billions of small objects across the system without any drop in performance. And then supporting things like S3 multi-part upload is important here as well, so that if we're doing transfers or backups of large VMs or applications, we're not having to re-transfer everything if there's a failure. So supporting that multi-part upload was, was very key as well. And then of course, density. So leveraging things like compression and erasure coding, we're able to get a decent density uh, across you know, lesser nodes. So with 5.11, we've introduced 120 terabyte nodes and we have 200 terabyte nodes on the roadmap. So in conclusion, managing your secondary storage shouldn't be difficult. And by combining the best HCI solution with backup capabilities of leading backup partners, as well as being able to manage object storage in the same platform and interface, you can benefit and, and take advantage of a modern and efficient backup solution in your data center. So for some more information about these products, you can check out our website. Mine is going GA later this year, and Objects 1.0 is available with AOS and Prism Central 5.11. And if you have an existing AOS cluster, you can get two terabytes for free automatically with 5.11. So thank you for joining. If we didn't address your question in the chat, we will be sure to follow up after the webinar. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, exciting new advancements there coming from Nutanix. Uh, we'll put those URLs uh, from uh, Laura in the chat as well if you want to check those out. But um, I do want to draw your attention to a poll question that's on the screen right now. And the poll question says, what additional information would you like about the Nutanix solution? And I'll just leave that up while we announce our final gift card winner. Uh, by the way, there also is a Nutanix link in the Handouts tab. If you want to go there and you can learn more about any of the Nutanix solutions that Laura covered in her presentation. All right. So uh, the final gift card winner on today's event, this is for an Amazon $500 gift card going to Eric. And I'm going to mispronounce your last name, Eric. Woji. Chowski, Wojciechowski from Indiana. Congratulations, Eric W. With a really long name, a uh, last name from Indiana, Eric W. From Indiana, you won the final gift card on today's event. Uh, if you didn't answer the poll question that is on the screen right there, go ahead and do that now uh, before you go. I want to uh, congratulate all the prize winners, uh, Mark Schaub from Illinois, Joe Ranella from Missouri, and Eric from Indiana. And then uh, finally, 
I want to remind you to make sure you check out our podcast, the 10 on Tech podcast, in the iTunes store. Uh, follow Actual Tech Media on LinkedIn. If you are a, p- a potential presenter on an upcoming event, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com to chat about the details. And I hope you'll join us for an upcoming event we have going on next week, actually next Wednesday. Uh, this is going to be a big mega cast. Uh, it's entitled Enabling Data Protection, DRAS, and Disaster Recovery Capabilities. And we're going to hear from uh, Datrium, Druva, Clumio, Zerto, Cohesity, and maybe some more will be joining us. Uh, and you have the chance to win one of five Alienware Aurora Gaming PCs. So going to be a cool event. Hope you'll see us. Uh, hope to see you on that event. Actually, after this event, as soon as we close here, you will be automatically redirected to our website, events.actualtechmedia.com, and it's there. You can register for this event if you didn't receive an invitation via email. I hope that you enjoyed today's EcoCast. Thank you so much for being on the event today. We always appreciate your participation. I hope that you have a great day. See you next time.